My name is Jess. I'm with Arts Alliance Illinois, and I'm really happy to be welcoming you to our webinar. Please continue to introduce yourself in the chat. We want this to be interactive, and we have a really amazing uh, group of experts here today to give you some incredible tips and tricks and resources. So before we get into that, I want to share a couple of housekeeping items. As you can see on your screen, we have ASL interpretation today, which should be pinned um, and spotlit to your screen. But if for some reason you're having trouble seeing that, go ahead and use the three dots on the side of the interpreter's Zoom window to pin them to your screen. Um, we're going to be going over uh, a couple of different exciting topics about aspects of your creative business um, that you maybe have been thinking about, looking for some more resources on. And we also will have some time for Q&A at the end. So we want you to use that chat, use the Q&A throughout, and we will be pausing as well with our panelists at the end to really dive deeper into some of those questions. Um, our plan for the day looks like this. We're going to be giving you a little bit of an overview of Arts Alliance Illinois briefly before we get started. For those of you, it might be your first time coming to one of our programs. Um, we'll pass it over to our experts and again, end with some Q&A. Um, I want to share a little bit about Arts Alliance Illinois. We are a statewide advocacy organization focused on building the creative sector's power through advocacy, policy change, and connection to resources. We have members from across disciplines, across counties and cities in Illinois, and uh, we're really excited to be expanding our work, providing direct support to creatives through our help desk, which I'll tell you a little bit about and which this program is a part of. Um, we do a lot of different really exciting things to support the creative sector here at Arts Alliance. We do advocacy and organizing work. We do research work trying to understand what are the challenges, opportunities that the creative sector is facing. And we also, as I was mentioning, provide uh, direct support, especially to help creatives navigate complicated government and public funding opportunities. So we know that there's uh, a lot, but not enough uh, public funding for the arts out there. And we want to make sure that that money really gets into the hands of the creatives who need it, particularly creatives on the south and west sides of Chicago in rural and disinvested areas in Illinois. We're really here to help you navigate the getting to the resources that you need so that your creative venture your creative business, your creative nonprofit can thrive. And the help desk um, is really the way that we do that. We're a one-stop shop for helping you find, understand, sometimes even apply for specific public funding opportunities. Um, and you can visit us at a link I'll drop in the chat to check out a list of upcoming public funding opportunities for the arts and actually talk to one of our staff one-on-one. -on -one. We also do things like our workshop series. And I want to mention now that this workshop series is supported by the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity uh, to really help the creative sector in Illinois thrive. We've been doing programs throughout the summer about key topics for starting a creative business, starting a creative nonprofit. That was in May. And the recordings of that you can find on our Arts Alliance YouTube page. This week, this is the last day of our Expanding Your Creative Business series. We'll have another series kind of geared in a similar vein towards what does it mean to think about expanding your creative nonprofit at the end of July. And then in September, we're bringing you some really exciting programs all about thinking about that next step. How do you take um, your creative business to the next level? What are some future planning things you need to be thinking about? As well as some other exciting programs kind of dotted throughout our summer uh, and next couple months, we've been doing programs on lending and loans for creatives, on um, reporting and compliance when you get government grants. So a lot of juicy, exciting programs with experts and also with fellow creatives like you who are talking about how they've navigated really important parts of their journey in making their creative business or creative nonprofit successful. So that is a lot of setup. I know you all are here to get some good information and tools. Um, I want to just encourage you again to use the chat uh, to ask questions, to take notes throughout, and remind you that this program is being recorded. So you don't need to memorize everything. This will be available for you to watch back later on the Arts Alliance uh, YouTube channel. Um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our first presenter, Odell, to take it away. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jess. And hello, everyone. I am Odell Mitchell III. I'm going to switch over here a little bit um, and bring up some information to be able to share with you all. So first of all, it's really great to see everyone. Great to have everyone. And I hope that you are doing wonderfully today. 
Uh, one of the things that I'll be talking about is uh, contracts and peace. So I am an entertainment attorney based largely here in Chicago, Illinois, um, and uh, large, and I'm from downstate and whatnot. So I love this entire state and I love that we have such representation across the entire state. And so one of the organizations I work with is Lawyers for the Creative Arts. Uh, we are a nonprofit uh, that services the arts and entertainment industry and uh, work directly with my firm that I have here in Chicago, Third and Line Legal. And with Third and Line Legal, we uh, work directly with artists and the artist community kind of all across the board. A uh, big part of what we've done for the number of years is music and just uh, heavily into the music industry, but also the film industry and really anything that touches anything creative. So if you are uh, among those folks, which I know many of us are, it's wonderful to have you. So like I said, what we'll do is we'll spend a little bit of time here talking about uh, contracts. So especially looking at demystifying contracts um, from a creative standpoint. If you're a creative professional, what does it mean to get into contracts and to be able to sign them and not feel like you're being steamrolled by something? Now, this is something that, of course, we could talk uh, extensively about. Certainly I could, because I love it. You know, I, we could talk extensively about. But I'll give you a little bit here um, around a few different pieces, and then we'll get an opportunity uh, later on, of course, uh, to ask questions and talk about anything. So if there's anything you need to toss out, please feel free. Now, here's a few of the things that we'll end up talking about. So I'm gonna just give you a breakdown of some of our like key terms and provisions that we tend to find in a contract. And then also a little bit about fees and compensation because you know everybody's gotta eat. And then also what does it mean to protect and advocate for yourself um, just when it comes to interacting with contracts and some of the challenges around them. So we'll look at a few of these things. Again, this is an overall sense from a creative standpoint. What does it mean to be a creative professional interacting? So when it comes to this, we'll look at this through that lens, but these are some of the things that apply to contracts in general, um, but you'll see that thread um, and find some familiarity when it comes to some of the things that we tend to look at in a creative realm. So first thing, first thing we'll look at is like kind of key terms and provisions, some of the stuff that tends to fall in a contract. So uh, I, you know, am, am more interested in getting some of your insight and perspective around things than I am necessarily just talking at you the entire time. So here's one thing we'll do. A couple of times here, we'll get an opportunity to ask a couple of questions, take a little bit of pulse and temperature around some of the things that we see. So the first thing I have is a question for you all uh, that you can enter in into this poll here. So whether you've used it before or not, this is what we'll do. You can see on screen that we're using a mentee poll. And what that is, is you've got a couple of ways to do it. You can either, if you have a device handy, use the QR code and it'll take you right to the poll to hop in there. You also see at the top, if you use the code, if you go to mentee.com and use the code that's right here at the top, you can utilize that to join into the poll. And then also I've dropped the information right in the chat as well. So you can click on that and that takes you directly to it. We've got a few questions that we'll use throughout our time. And so as we go through this, you'll be able to step into it. So I'll ask our first question. If you wanna join the poll, please feel free. To, uh, if, if everyone does, it animates automatically. If no one does it, it looks pretty static and I have to make up some answers. But I'm curious, when you're thinking about contracts, how do you feel about your ability to read and understand a contract? What's some of the range you have here? How do you feel about your ability to read and understand a contract? This is great, so thanks. I see some folks answering here. I'll give us a few moments as people continue to answer, but I'm, I'm curious to see. Yeah, we've got a range, this is good. I totally understand. If you feel like meh, ugh, I don't know about that. It's totally, that's great, you're in the right spot. And if you feel some levels of comfort, you know, or even feel pretty good about it, that's excellent as well. Some of this might apply in a way where you go, okay, this is validating because these are some of the things I tend to think. And then if you're, you know, like me, you love the smell of border plate in the morning, like that's totally understandable. If you like getting in the weeds of it, you feel really adept, fantastic. So whatever range of uh, interaction you feel around it, that's wonderful to see. So like I said, we'll come back to some of this in a little bit here, but we'll talk a little bit about what we mean when it comes to some of the provisions that come up in our contracts here. So the few different things that we'll look at when we're talking about key terms and provisions, really what we mean are some of the standard pieces that you would tend to find in a contract. So some of the standard things that tend to come up and uh, the way they may look. Now, again, all of these could range in different ways, but here are a few things that tend to happen. So some of the key terms we'll look at are term itself, uh, services, 
then also what we would consider the grant of rights, then also fees, compensation, and what are we, what are we talking about when we're looking at termination? Now, the overall idea here is, you know, basically, you really shouldn't be signing something without someone looking at it that feels that they uh, have some real understanding of it. Generally, that's me. Like I always say, don't sign anything without having me look at it first. But at the same time, I also want people to know what they're signing. I want you to feel empowered because you don't always have the ability to go through full review or something along those lines. So certainly... Uh, we at Lawyers for the Creative Arts especially are happy to help with these kinds of things, but still, I don't want people to be uh, feel like they are um, steamrolled by the information that's coming at them because I get it. You look at a contract, it's legalese, your eyes cross, totally understandable. So a few things that we'll look at here. So I'll show you a little bit of what these might look like in an agreement when you see them. So the first thing we'll look at is term. So when we're talking about term, what we really mean is how long the contract lasts. So you see in our example here, there is a, a section in the actual contract called term. It's wonderful when that happens, when it says term, and you see that there. Now, honestly, it's not always broken down that way. It doesn't always label it with a heading that says term. So really, what is that section around term? Well, this is, again, what is the contract length? Like, how long does it last? What is the relationship going to be there? Sometimes that is simple. Sometimes it might be something very clear, like this is a one-year contract, and it might spell that out. Like in this example here, it even says that this will continue for a period of 12 months. So we know that this is a one-year contract. Sometimes the term might be a little more complicated, or it might be based upon what's being delivered. So maybe it's not in time, but it's really around, okay, well, this is for a certain amount of deliveries. For instance, in music, maybe it's for a certain amount of records being delivered, or maybe it's until the full production is complete, however long that takes. So it might be, the term might be determined by a piece, but it's really what's the start and end of this. Now, from a practical standpoint, when you're looking at something like this, you're typically looking at, okay, how long does this last? And then what's the relationship there? So another question is, does this automatically renew? Is it done when it's done? What's some of the language there? Sometimes you'll see that it is for a year, but it's going to continue to keep going unless something happens, unless one person terminates it or um, unless something happens to end the contract. So you're really looking for that. Again, how long is this and does it continue, et cetera? So if it says term, awesome. If it doesn't say term, it should be there pretty early on because you want to know what you're getting into. So that's our first key term and provision. Now, the next piece that you tend to be looking for is services. What is being done in this agreement? What is being done in this relationship? Yeah, so it could be a, a various things. For example, you know, if you're a songwriter, maybe you're providing songwriting services. Maybe that's what is happening. Or maybe you're a producer and you're providing production for a project, an album, a single, something along those lines. Maybe this is you're doing set design for an entire set, or maybe you're doing voiceover work, or maybe this is a talent agreement for acting. What is it? What is the service that's being provided? What is expected of you and the expertise that you're providing here? That should be outlined pretty clearly. Now, again, depending on the agreement and the situation, it might be something that's fairly simple or very straightforward, especially if it's a very uh, specific, simple thing that is being done, or it could be particularly extensive. This might be, if it's a longer engagement, you know, if I'm doing someone's talent agreement because they're gonna be the lead actor in a movie, this section is gonna be pretty long because the amount of services and the details around them will be specific. But nevertheless, this should be a police piece that you're looking for to understand, okay, what are the services being offered and what is expected of me? Also, this will give you a sense of what is outside of the realm of services. And so if something is being asked of you that's not included in here, that's not something you contracted for. And so this really gives you a square to draw around what is expected of you in that sense. So that's our next piece, services. Uh, now, another key term that you're typically looking for is what we would consider the grant of rights. Now, this one doesn't always say grant of rights. Quite frankly, seldom does it say grant of rights. But this is really, the core of it is, look, what am I giving away and what is in exchange for compensation or something of the sort? What rights are being given away? What right, rights are being withheld or rights am I retaining? So for example, as we see in kind of our, our uh, version here, if this is someone who is um, offering a composition or a song or something along those lines, well, 
maybe this song is being licensed. So I'm the rights I'm giving are exclusive licensing rights to an organization. Or maybe this is something where I have, have written a song and now I'm doing this as a work for hire. So I'm actually turning over all of the rights to it um, and not going to uh, get anything in return for it other than the upfront fee. Or maybe this is something where I am assigning like a limited use of my work. It can be used for this project or for this exhibit or something of the sort. What rights are being given and what rights am I retaining? This again, depending on what the uh, information is, can be long, short, et cetera. Like it really can be broken down in a couple of ways, but you really wanna be able to see, okay, what is the grant of rights that's given here? And what's that expectation there? Now this again, isn't always um, kind of an even thing. Like you might be giving up a lot of rights in exchange for high compensation or very little for low compensation. Only you can decide if it's worth it, but this should be broken down here. What is that grant of rights that you're giving over? Now, a few more terms that I think are worth making sure that you have, that you see. So the next one is fees and compensation. Again, usually we're not always, we're not doing this just out of the goodness of our heart. I would recommend that if you have a specialized uh, uh, skill, talent, like it is of high value to this world. And so to be compensated for what you're doing is extremely important. And so in this section, you should have clear sense of compensation. So the overall sense is, well, what is the rate of pay? Now, this can look a lot of different ways, depending on the kind of agreement, depending on the kind of services. Sometimes maybe it's a flat fee. So maybe I'm you know, charging it in a flat fee, or maybe it's something hourly. We'll actually talk about a breakdown of some of our fees and compensation in a little bit, but this can look a lot of different ways on what it is. Now, you definitely wanna see it broken down though in a clear sense of what are, what are you expecting? And especially in this section, um, or you know, even if it's more extensive, what you really should know is when are you getting paid as well? Not only how, what are you getting paid, but also how are you getting paid and when are you getting paid? In a standard uh, nine to five W-2 job, something of the sort, the standard thing that people often get is like a bi-weekly paycheck. But as we know in creative space, that's not always the case. This might happen quarterly. It might be something that happens weekly. It might be hap something that happens all up front. It might be based upon so some sort of combination of residual payment after an initial fee. All of that should be broken down in an understanding of fees and compensation. So sometimes you see it listed as payment, sometimes it's listed as fees, sometimes it says fee schedule. It might be also including things like royalties, depending on what it is that you're offering and what the services are. So if it's something that is also going to include royalties, you typically should see that there. So you want to be able to see what's the rate of pay, what's the actual compensation there, and also when should I be expecting this as compared to the work that I am doing. So again, another really key piece that you tend to find in there. Now, two more real uh, key things that you tend to find is termination. So this is really your, a clause that you want to find in the in the agreement that is really around how to end the agreement. So we talked about how the term might break down and say, okay, this is how long the agreement lasts. It might be a one-year agreement, or it might be because there's a certain amount of uh, delivery that you're doing. So three albums or two movies or something along those lines. But, and then once it's done, maybe it, it ends on its own. But termination is really about, well, how do we end the agreement other than through satisfaction? If something happens and we need to end this agreement, what does that look like? Quite frankly, this is a really important provision, but it's often missed. Every time people are excited to get something going um, and really get things moving, but a lot of times there's not even this section in here. And so that's one of the things I'm generally scanning for because it's great when things are happening as we want them to, but if something goes wrong and we want to, one or both of us needs to end the agreement, what does that look like? So this can look a lot of different ways, but usually it requires some version of notice to be given to one of the parties um, in a specific way that notice tends to have to happen. Sometimes there are parameters around what uh, constitutes a termination. A lot of times you can't just say, well, I don't wanna do this anymore. There's, this is an actual um, agreement, a requirement. And so sometimes there, this will talk about if there's a breach, You know, if someone did something within the confines of the agreement that automatically breaks the relationship, it might break that down here. So you typically wanna have this um, in this regard. 
And I am generally pushing to make sure that the people that I'm representing have a good sense of clarity around this and good power here. This is oftentimes not an equal thing. Um, and so being able to have some real uh, relief around how you get out of something is important. It's key because quite frankly, um, I tell my clients, you know, I'm trying to be headache medicine for folks. Uh, a lot of times this stuff is headaches. And one of the biggest headaches a lot of times is when things were going well and then they stop going well. And even if both parties go, you know what, we should end this, we should get out of this, but there's no clear termination here. That can be a really protracted experience going, okay, well, I think it should end this way. Well, I think it should end this way. And so having some framework and termination to be able to move things along can be helpful. Now, those are some of your key pieces that you tend to find in there, but there's also, as we know, a lot of times an agreement will have a lot more stuff in there. So here's the last thing that you'll tend to find in any agreement is what we consider boilerplate. These are standard provisions that are found in most contracts of a similar nature. And so um, in that regard, these matter, the words matter. It's not just legalese that's in there, but this is stuff that you expect to see repeated in, an or in a contract. And quite frankly, a lot of times it doesn't change a lot. So you might get through some of the key provisions and then see a lot more information that is boilerplate information in there. So for example, maybe a jurisdiction clause. It tells us which laws we are referencing in this contract. Well, if we are gonna be in Illinois, then we might be saying, okay, this references Illinois. The state of Illinois is our jurisdiction here. And if that's gonna be it, then it may not change every single time. So we see that that's going to be there. Or an entire agreement clause where we just say that, you know, this, this contract is the entire contract. Nothing on the outside of this contract uh, ref is referenced inside of here. Again, they tend to look the same. You tend to see them. Um, and it's good to know what is in there, especially if it's the first time you're seeing it, but you tend to see over time that, okay, these boilerplate things are in the, they look this way in this kind of agreement. They look the same in most um, product, production contracts, but they look different in a photography contract, but they look same in all similar photography contracts, et cetera. So it's good to know those things, scan them for sure, make sure no one's trying to slip anything in there. But at the same time, a lot of what you find in most agreements is boilerplate, boilerplate provisions. And once you know that, then you know that you won't feel quite as overwhelmed because you're looking for some of those other key pieces. Okay, so you're ready. You're, you're ready to like go out there and like sign all the contracts, do it all yourself. You've got all the information. Not necessarily. So there's a, a couple of other things that I think are worth looking at. Uh, to understand the key things are some of our key provisions in this sense uh, it's really really helpful but also again knowing what some of our fees and compensation tend to be is helpful so let's talk a little bit about fees and compensation um, in that regard now what we'll do is when it comes to this i do have another question so i'll switch this over and here's our second question so what are some common kinds of compensation so again if you've just joined or you don't have this already we're using a mentee poll here. You see the QR code. You can use that to um, join if you'd like to. I've also got it dropped here in the chat if you'd like to uh, do so. And then also you see there's the information at the top. Well, what are some kinds of compensation? What do you think? This is great. I see some answers coming through. Wonderful. Give us a moment as we answer. It's great. This is great. Yeah, I see a lot of them. Yeah, there's always a facetious answer in there. So glad we're not taking the bait. It's good to see. Yeah, this is great. We've got flat fees, hourly fees, commissions. Like some of these can be certainly some of the fees that tend to come across. So yeah, let's talk about a few of these so that we have a good sense of what it is that uh, we are looking at when it comes to some of our fees. So the few different ways the fees might break down and I'll just give us a sense of a few of them. We've got flat fees, hourly fees, commission or percentage fees, and then also a combination. So it could really be a lot of different things that could give us a sense of how these might work. So when it comes to compensation, flat fee is a really common one that we run into. So this would be like a single rate or sum for the services that are provided. Now this could be broken up in various ways, but really the idea is here's the services that are being provided and then this is the rate of pay that's coming back for it. So I'm doing this one thing and then I'm getting paid one time for it. Or maybe I'm doing 10 things when I'm getting paid one time for it. So it's really this idea that there's a flat fee across the board for that. And so this can be set in a lot of different ways, determined by the market, determined by your experience, et cetera. But a lot of times it's one of the most upfront ways to get a clear sense of what your bargain for exchange is, what that value is going to be. 
Now, another common way is hourly fees, charging by the hour. And so, especially if something is going to be an extensive project that takes a lot of time, it's very time intensive, well, that time is very valuable. So it could be a certain rate per hour that is going with it in that regard. Again, uh, depending on who you are and what you're doing, you might have a good sense of what that means uh, when it comes to what's that cost there. Now, the other piece is commission. So if you've got commission or percentage fees, this would be, okay, what are those pieces there that uh, come into it where it's a percentage of the money generated uh, by the project itself that is due to you. So maybe as the project continues going on, then it continues to bring in uh, revenue and then there's a percentage that comes to you. So again, maybe it's a, a movie that's going to, as it continues to uh, have a high gross, then a percentage of those royalties come to you or an album or something like that where it has a percentage of royalties that comes to it. So this can be defined a lot of different ways, gross receipts, net receipts. Um, you see a lot of language that comes in there. It's usually not listed as commission um, in a lot of ways, but that percentage piece um, is common. And then quite frankly, the more you get into it, it's usually a combination of pieces where you've got maybe a flat fee or hourly fees plus a commission. So you can combine these in multiple ways to be able to gain general compensation in that. You wanna see it outlined there and you wanna have a clear sense of what's coming to you. Now, the question that people often ask is, okay, well, how do I know what to charge? It's really hard and uh, I, I can't, as a lawyer, I can't give you a presentation without giving you a standard answer. It depends, uh, but it really does depend on what your uh, industry is, your experiences, you know, what is being asked of you, et cetera. The reality is only you know your true worth. And so if you need to experiment with it, if you have control over it, certainly do so. But people will pay what you're worth and you your, your contributions, again, are worth quite a lot. Now, here's the last thing I wanna to mention to you when it comes to this. So we've got a sense of some of our key provisions and also um, a quick sense of what some of our fees and com commissions are. The last thing is when it comes to protecting and advocating for yourself. A lot of times when people get into a contract, they feel like, oof, this is a lot. I'm not quite sure how I feel about this, how I might navigate this. And so a couple of things to keep in mind when it comes to it. First of all, we are here to help. So someone like me is here to certainly help you through this so you don't have to face it alone. Same with the Lawyers for the Creative Arts. It's a great network of volunteer attorneys that are here to help people as they're navigating agreements. But a couple of things to keep in mind when it comes to it. First of all, having a contract is meant to help you protect. It does not always feel good to be in the midst of something creative and go, ah, did we sign something like that can just be kind of an awkward experience, but I highly encourage it. And especially from the standpoint that the reason we put things into a contract is to protect all parties involved. Sometimes there's this feeling that, well, why do you want a contract? Because you don't trust me? It's hardly that. It's really so that we can make sure that we have all things clear and we can focus on doing the thing that we are actually enjoying rather than, again, these headaches that come here. So having a contract, just even having a conversation about it and then having it in place can be helpful. Second, you wanna register your works as best you can. So whether it's copyrights or trademarks, whatever the case may be, having official registration can be very helpful when it comes to making sure that you have protection in place. Again, you don't have to navigate your, that yourself, lots of ways in which we can help, but actually having your works registered properly, especially when you have to interact with the legal system is particularly key. Last couple of things around this is you want to know your values. What's important to you? Autonomy, transparency, freedom. What are the things that are important to you that will help you know if this is great for you? Is this a good opportunity for me? Just because it's an opportunity may not be the right opportunity for me because it might move against some of my values. Also, sometimes people are worried about pricing themselves out of something. So sometimes you can set a range for it. Rather than saying, I charge this and being worried that you might lose the gig because of that, which is a real fear, because I usually charge between this and this, and I'd really like to stay within that range. If that's helpful, good language and helps you really see that, then it can really help establish that you really want to stay within something, but you're open and you want to uh, be involved in this. And the last thing that I highly encourage is understand that urgent is not the same as important. People get excited, people push, people want things to happen, and that's great. But if someone is sending you an agreement and they're like, you got to sign this by today, otherwise this is off the table, consider whether that urgency is real or whether it's manufactured. And just because it feels like something is urgent doesn't mean it's important or necessarily automatically a good thing. 
And just because something is important doesn't mean it's always going to be urgent. Some of the things that are most important to us may not send off klaxons and make us get pulled into it. So be mindful that urgent and important are not the same thing, but people often conflate them, especially in the process of negotiation when it comes to it. Okay, a couple of things. Make sure that you have you know, contracts uh, in place because they're meant to help, not hinder. And you don't have to do it all yourself. There's been a couple of resources already in the chat that kind of help with it. Um, and so by all means, lean into some of that. And then, hey, look, if you feel overwhelmed or confused by any of this, that's okay. This is confusing. That's why we exist to really help demystify it. So don't feel like you have to go through it all on yourself because we are here to help. So we'll talk about, we'll get a chance to jump into some uh, question and answer pieces a little bit later. But again, I just want to make sure to give you a sense of that to be able to demystify some of those pieces. So um, I will be around in a bit. And then also you can always reach me in different ways and also Lawyers for the Creative Arts uh, as another way for us to interact around some of these pieces when that. So you'll find some of that there. Um, those are the things that I have. Jess, I wasn't sure if you want me to pass it to you or just write to Chris. That was great, Odell. Thank you so much. And yeah, the only thing I was going to say, you already plugged. So yeah, I see we have some great questions in the Q&A section. Never fear, we're going to get to some of these just after our next presentation. Um, so keep those questions coming. Take some notes about the things that you are still chewing on. Um, I'm sure if you have a question, others might share it. But thank you so much for that, Odell. That was great. Chris, I am going to go ahead and spotlight you and pass it over to you to talk right. insurance. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Odell. Um, my name is Chris Johnson. I own Johnson East Brokerage. We're an independent insurance agency based in Chicago. It's focused on arts and entertainment clients. Um, our biggest clients are in film, theater, music, and live events. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is I'm gonna give you a definition of insurance. And I always hate when you ask someone the time and they tell you how to make a watch, but I do think it's valuable if you just have a visceral understanding of insurance, it helps you um, have an idea of, you know, its value and when you need it, that type of thing. Then we'll talk about a little bit about the industry organization, and that'll kind of help you navigate when you are interacting with people in the insurance world. Then we'll talk about um, types of insurance that are available and some that are important to arts organizations. And then what I think is the fun part of the presentation, we'll do some claim scenarios, some real world, world things that ha happened or, and, and how those were handled by insurance. And then, uh, as everyone's mentioned, there's time for Q&A at the end. Um, so one of the things I want to say here is that there's actually multiple or origin stories for insurance. Insurance was invented by many different cultures around the world at many different times in history. Um, and so I'm picking just one. And this one is very, very Eurocentric. But I've selected it because I think some of the terminology is very understandable to us as Westerners or as Americans. Um, so we're going to go back to Lloyd's Coffee Shop in 1688. And Lloyd's Coffee Shop just happened to have a nice view of the port in London. And this was the time when um, the new world was an exciting new place. And um, you could make riches just by sending a ship there and bringing treasures back. So the people that financed ships and sent them off to the new world started hanging out at Lloyd's Coffee Shop. And they would literally sit there and look out the window and wait for their ship to come in. This is where the saying actually was developed, waiting for your ship to come in. Uh, but you also have to remember it might not come in. And that was a big risk. If, you, if your ship came in, you were uber wealthy, you were Elon Musk wealthy. If your ship sank and never came back, um, you could be a pauper and end up on the street. So it was a big issue for these, you know, wealthy men. And, you know, they were all men at the time meeting in this coffee shop. And a coffee shop is just like high school. Everyone ends up sitting in the same every day. So the people at individual tables got to know each other pretty well. So at one point, someone said, hey, let's throw our money in a pot. If someone ships fails to return, if it sinks, he gets the pot. Um, he financially survives, right, and gets to, to finance another ship and sail another day. Um, 
And this is really an example of financial risk sharing. So now the five or six people that are sitting around this table are all sharing the risk that one of their um, ships will sink. Or you can also think of it as risk transferring. Each individual is transferring the risk of their ship sinking, the financial risk of it, to the group. Um, and this is the example of the first insurance syndicate of what we today know as Lloyd's of London. And you've probably heard of Lloyd's of London. They're famous for insuring strange things like a dancer's legs or a model's lips kind of thing. But they initially started off insuring ships coming to the new world to, to bring wealth back to the old world. And then at some point, some of the syndicates, which the syndicate is just a group of guys sitting around a table, decided, hey, why don't we insure ship owners outside of our group? And boom, modern insurance was born. Um, and so a really simple definition of insurance is its financial risk transfer. So if you think about, um, and let's use uh, homeowner's insurance as an example. So when you buy a home, it's a small risk, but you have some risk that that house will burn down and you'll have nothing. Well, if you pay a small amount to an insurance company per month, small relative to the value of the home, they'll take that risk from you and they'll say, if your house burns down, we'll pay to rebuild it. That's financial risk transfer. Um, and that's the core of what insurance is. So now I want to talk a little bit about how the insurance industry is organized because this impacts how you interact with it. And the first major sort of division in the overall insurance industry is between personal lines and commercial lines. So personal lines is pretty you know, self-explanatory. It's about insuring your personal life. So it's about homeowner's insurance, renter's insurance, personal auto insurance. It protects your personal assets and your personal life. And then commercial insurance is um, business insurance. It's about insuring your business. Um, and Oftentimes people get them confused and I'll have people say to me, well, I have renter's insurance. Doesn't that cover my business? No. Or I have business insurance. Doesn't that cover things in my home? No, they are completely separate. And if you are a business owner, you need both personal insurance and commercial insurance. Um, and if you have an art practice, you are a business owner. So you need to think about the, the two types of coverage. And of course, today we're gonna focus on commercial lines because um, this is you know, a business seminar. So then let's talk about um, another way that the, that the um, industry, the insurance industry faces their markets. And so commercial line insurers are actually specialized um, by the types of businesses that they insure. And these are obviously just a couple examples, but transportation, there are insurance companies and insurance agents that focus on insuring trucking companies and shipping companies and airlines. Then there are people, companies and people that focus on manufacturing. Um, you know, they'll they'll insure, you know, an auto or a food manufacturer, those types of things. And there are insurance companies that focus specifically on the arts, insurance companies and insurance agents who focus on the arts. And sometimes people will come to me in frustration and saying, you know, um, I went to my agent and they don't understand anything about what I do. It's maybe not that they're a bad agent. It's maybe that you're talking about to an agent that, that focuses on transportation or manufacturing. They don't focus on the art, so they're just not familiar. So you may want to find somebody that focuses in, in the insurance world that focuses on the arts. And then even within the arts, the industry is broken down further. And there's people that um, focus on the performing arts. There's people that focus on the visual arts, and there's people that focus just on film and television. So again, it's important that when you're approaching the insurance industry, you find somebody that works in a segment that understands what it is you do. All right, now let's talk about the types of commercial insurance and a big split in the types of insurance you can buy between property insurance and liability insurance. And property insurance you're probably most familiar with, and that's insuring physical things in the world. And you can think about, again, homeowner's insurance, right? A home is a physical thing. Well, businesses also own physical things. You know, they might own buildings. They might have inventory. Um, you know, they may own computers, um, even things like office furniture. That's property insurance. 
Liability insurance is insurance for if you end up owing a third party money because of something you did. So you've caused property damage to someone through your business, or you've even caused um, bodily injuries to someone through your business. Liability insurance covers these types of losses. And I'm going to start off by talking about liability insurance because it's typically the source of um, uh, where bigger losses come from. So some types of liability categories, the most common one that all businesses, including art businesses need is general liability. And the memory device I'll give is that general liability relates to the general public, um, general public being people not involved directly in your organization. Um, auto liability has to do with if uh, your employees, um, your 1099 people, your volunteers are driving for the business, um, you need auto liability if they're involved in accidents. Workers' compensation covers workers, uh, people being paid to work um, if they're injured while working. And um, this can include both traditional W-2 employees as well as, depending on the situation, people paid as 1099 as well. Liquor liability. Um, this is a liability if you're selling liquor. And something that people in the arts always ask me is like, well, we just ask for a donation. We don't sell liquor. If you're taking money for liquor, um, from an insurance standpoint, we consider that selling liquor and you would need liquor liability coverage. Um, and finally, volunteer accident medical. Um, this is where a volunteer is injured and it helps pay for some of their medical expenses. It's important to note that in the state of Illinois, volunteers are not covered by workers' comp. So if you have volunteers, you may want to consider volunteer accident medical. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about uh, property insurance. And there's really two points I want you to take away with property insurance. Um, one of the things you want to know on your policy is what causes of loss are covered. The policy is going to actually list and say, if this happens, it's covered. If this happens, it's covered. Um, and for example, theft and fire are almost always covered. You know, if things are stolen from your office, typically insurance will cover that. If your office burns down, typically insurance will cover that. Um, Storms are typically covered, uh, although named storms may be excluded. So tropical storms and hurricanes may be excluded. Um, floods, flood coverage typically has to be purchased separately. And so where you want to think about that is if you're operating out of, say, a basement, um, you know, Chicago has a long history of basements flooding. So you may want to think of flood insurance in that situation. Earthquake coverage also has to be purchased separately. And terrorism coverage is typically optional. You can opt in or out of terrorism coverage. So I just want you to take away the point that there's specific causes of loss listed on your policy. And if there's some type of loss you're specifically concerned about, you want to tell your agent, hey, am I covered for this? If not, how do I get covered? The other thing on property insurance that you want to think of is valuation. And the policy will also say, also, explain, also determine if, if something is lost if a piece of property is destroyed, what is the value of that property that the insurance company will pay? There's typically two options, um, replacement cost and actual cash value. Basically, replacement cost is what you paid for something when you bought it. Actual cash value deducts depreciation over time, saying that something you bought five years ago is worth less than it was five years ago. It could be a huge difference in value, so you want to understand that. Um, these other three I only list here because they're relevant to fine art. And so if you are in, in the fine art business, you may, you know, you will come across these. And again, there can be huge differences in value. So you want to understand what valuation will be provided by your policy. Um, and now I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball. There's this category of insurance called Inland Marine. Um, and it always freaks people out that, why do I have Marine on my policy? The short answer is it's just a dated term for a, a group of um, insurance coverages. But where it came from is, remember we were talking about Lloyd's of London who insured ships? Okay, that was called Marine insurance. Well, when insurance companies like Lloyd's decided to diversify and start offering products for land, for things on the land, 
they called it inland marine insurance. So brilliant branding, and it stuck with us for you know 400 years. So here we are. But what the other thing that the types of things that typically fall under inland marine insurance are things that need to be covered in more than one location. So if you think about your office furniture in your office only needs to be covered there. You're typically not taking your furniture out and using it in other places. But fine art can be in multiple places, right? It could be at your gallery. It could be on loan to a museum. It could be on loan to a potential collector. So fine art falls under Inland Marine. Um, camera and lighting equipment for filmmakers falls under Inland Marine. Costumes and props in the theater world fall under Inland Marine. So just know it's a category of coverages that may be relevant to your business. Um, so I'm going to go through some claim scenarios. And I know we're running short on time, so I will be trying to be quick on this. So um, scenario one is you're painting a mural using a crane and it smashes, accidentally smashes the window of a business next door. Um, this is going to be a general liability claim. The business next door is not part of your business. They're, from your standpoint, part of the general public, and your general liability policy would kick in there. Um, a student in your art class, uh, art glass class, cuts their hand and needs medical attention. That's going to be a participant accident medical claim. We talked about volunteer accident medical. There's also a category for participants, so people who are involved in doing uh, what your programming is. Um, Here's uh, basically your gallery is broken into and art is stolen. That is Inland Marine insurance. We've talked about that fine art falls in the Inland Marine category. And the valuation options that you choose for your policy are going to be very important in this scenario. That's why I pointed those out previously. Um, lightning strikes an electrical transformer and you have to cancel your annual fundraiser. Um, we have not talked about this specifically here. I'm just trying to make you aware of there are a lot of other types of insurance. Event cancellation is one of them. Um, so you can insure in case your event gets canceled. Uh, while driving to an art fair, a gallery assistant hits a gas station canopy. Um, you would not believe how common claims like this are. It also comes up in filmmaking a lot where a production assistant is driving a grip truck and hits the canopy at a gas station. So this is an auto liability um, claim. And note that auto liability can cover rented vehicles, like you probably don't own this truck, you're renting the truck. And it can, it can cover um, 1099 people driving for you as well. So it's important to think about the details there. Um, here is one where um, someone in the audience at like a theater event or a music event uh, trips and falls going to their seat. It's a very common claim. And this is going to be a general liability claim. Members of the audience are considered part of the general public. Um, a paid dancer breaks their leg. Um, this is going to be a workers' comp claim. And you'll notice I emphasize paid. That's why it's workers' comp. If they were a volunteer, you'd have to have volunteer accident medical coverage to cover this. Um, and here we go. A volunteer taking tickets slips on, on spilled soda and breaks three teeth. That's going to be a volunteer accident medical claim. Um, and I think this is the last one. After a day at a uh, summer theater camp, a camper tells their parent that a teacher touched them inappropriately. Um, this, again, is another coverage we haven't talked about, abuse and molestation. There's a specific coverage for this, this type of situation. Um, if you're working with children, this is something you definitely want to think about. Oh, there is one more. Sorry. One of your bartenders overserves a customer. They get in an auto accident on the way home and the victims sue you. This is a liquor liability claim. Um, and remember, taking donations you know, for liquor may get you in as much trouble as selling liquor. Um, and things can happen away from your location that can still lead to lawsuits. Like the, the, the auto accident happened on the person's way home and you can still be sued. All right. That's the end of my prepared presentation. Let's see. 1054. Um, so I think we'll let Jess come back and um, handle questions. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm going to bring both you and Odell back for this uh, for this Q and A portion. I know there are a ton of questions in the chat, questions uh, in the Q and A section, and again, just want to encourage everyone really bring your questions, your wonderings, things you want to clarify. Um, your questions may be helpful for, for someone else. 
Um, so maybe let's go uh, back to some of our older questions. I see there's a couple have come in about um, about contracts and maybe I'll start with one that I'm sure you're hearing a lot recently, Odell. One is about who should be drafting your contracts. This person has helpfully asked if it should be a lawyer like you, if AI can do it, or if a basic one that you can find online is acceptable. I did see someone dropped in the chat as well that there are some templated contracts, but when someone is trying to figure out like, where do I even start? Who needs to be writing this for me? What would your answer to this kind of question be? Yeah, uh, well, of course it depends. No, I'm, uh, it will be a few things. So you're, you're kind of listing them in sort of the tiers. So if we're thinking about, okay, you know, who can draft them? The, the reality when it comes to this is around like, you know, these are there's a couple of different layers around how we would interact with some of these pieces. So, um, you know, who who can draft it, what's going to make it best, et cetera. There, there are um, a couple of it depends pieces around it. So I would say from moving from the bottom up right now, AI is not going to be strong enough for you to have a full contract that you should feel confident of its legal certainty around that because there are some aspects where it's going to pull some pieces it's going to give you something that looks really great and a lot of really great substance there but it's still not to the point to where it's going to give you solid form contracts that you should feel really great will stand up in the uh, court of law or also hold to the agreements that you need it to but form contracts there are plenty of form contracts online that a lot of times will get you pretty close. Um, a lot, some of them are great. You know, uh, like we said, we saw some of the um, resources in the chat that can be really helpful. And, and especially the more niche the industry, um, you know, being in an arts industry, a lot of times we see some pretty niche contracts. So there are some places where you definitely can find some formed contracts that have potentially been drafted by attorneys or have been proven over time to be effective where that might be helpful. So it's not a bad place to start. The ultimate answer though, is that all contracts, even if they look fairly similar, um, it's best to have an attorney either draft it or look over it. So that's not at all uncommon what I run into. Usually I like to uh, start, but if someone is coming to me, sometimes they might say, I have this agreement, can you take a look at it? And I'll be looking through and I'll be looking to see if there are gaps, holes, et cetera, in that sense. So certainly seldom do I erase the whole thing and just start all over. A lot of times there are provisions there that are going to be pretty solid, but making sure there's a clear understanding of what um, certain words mean is key. Simple words like that we might think about um, can have a significant impact in a legal sense. So your overall answer is it's best to have an attorney draft it or at least look over it um, and give you a real sense of where it is. But you may start quite uh, from a practical standpoint, you might start with some form documents from a reputable source, um, especially since that's one of the things that makes them more accessible. Hope that helps. That's great. Thanks, Adele. And I actually see a question that sort of bridges the two pieces of this conversation. So maybe I'll kick it to both of you. You can start us off, Chris, and you can um, uh, spike it down, Odell. Uh, I, I see someone is asking that there are two very common types of contracts that creative orgs are signing. So leases for studio space, theater space, and insurance policies like liability workers comp that some of uh, those you were just talking about, Chris. So um, I think this person is asking about general guidance for reading or assessing those two kinds of major contracts. Um, but if you all have other reactions to, okay, these are the big kind of contracts or kinds of insurance that I really see people most commonly using, um, maybe we can fill this answer in with a little bit of that as well. Um, so, okay. So I'll, I guess I'll jump in on the insurance side. Um, so yeah, obviously, or I guess I don't have to tell anyone they know that insurance policies are difficult to read. Um, but uh, I guess rather than talking about types of insurance, I'll talk about sections of the insurance policy that you should definitely read. There's a section called the declarations page or people in the biz call it deck page, um, short for declarations page. But that, that shows you the coverages that you have and the limits that you have. Um, so you should definitely look at that. And then um, basically the main body of an insurance policy is, is typically a standard form that's used across the industry. Um, but where that is modified and changed is called endorsements. 
Um, and so you would at least want to read the declarations and the endorsements um, on your policy um, and then ask your questions to your agent um, and keep asking until they make it understandable. Um, but I will also say that um, a insurance policy is actually a contract between you, the insured, and the insurance company. It is a legally enforceable contract. So it's also fine to ask your attorney to look at it, especially if, if it's contingent on signing a major agreement. Um, you know, you may want to make sure that your insurance policy and that agreement, which may have insurance requirements, meet. Um, your insurance agent will look at that too, but you, but it, it's beneficial to have your attorney look at it as well. The two things will work hand in hand. We're trying to quote the insurance that satisfies the contract. Your attorney may be trying to renegotiate some of the terms in the contract, and so the two things kind of go together. So now I'll I'll set it for Odell, and he can spike it. I would basically say I very much agree. Like you're you're absolutely right that. If this, you know, if someone's bringing me something um, that has large insurance provisions in it, I would say I want them to dance together in the right way. And so um, it's always, you know, uh, surrender the strengths of others is really the way that I would look at it. And so you're wanting to make sure that those pieces are lined up very much like you said. And rather than relying on just my own knowledge with that, I would go right to the insurance agent and make sure that everything is lining up in those pieces. And so by all means, the more complicated and the more extensive uh, the insurance agreement and uh, or the more significant the potential liability, the more I say, we won't wanna do this in a vacuum. We wanna make sure that what we're talking about and what we're agreeing to is lining up with the actual insurance and the actual agreement that you have there in that sense. So spiked. Thanks for bearing with my volleyball metaphor, y'all, <laughs> or tennis, whatever your your preference is. Um, I see there's a question here about um, like geographies, and I wonder actually if we can broaden this beyond contracts. So um, the person is asking about whether contracts need to be specific to the state that they're in. Um, this may be common for those of you all who are artists who are, you know, selling work or collaborating across state lines or even internationally, how do you all talk to folks about contracts and insurance when people might be rooted in one place or several places or working across maybe different jurisdictions? And either one of you could start. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start on here. So when it comes to, I would say, um, you know, the state and the jurisdiction of how things are bearing themselves down does matter. Like that's kind of the overall piece. But it of course depends on what it is that is being contracted. And so, um, for example, some things might be happening on a more federal level. And so the way that the things are happening, it might you know go across the board. But quite frankly, most contracts, I definitely want to make sure that, that is keyed toward the jurisdiction where may, things are mainly going to be happening. So for example, you know, if someone is doing um, contract work here, they're based here in Illinois, but the work that they're going to be doing is going to be in California, then you're likely going to be and should be signing an agreement that is going to reference California because the laws are going to be different there. And if something does happen, then that might be what we would consider the venue. That would be the the area where an action is taken, whether it's, you know, court, small claims court, et cetera. And so the laws in that venue are generally going to guide that um, particular agreement. And so they do generally, you do generally want them to reflect uh, the area, especially if it's an industry that has different laws in different places. And that's one of the reasons that uh, different spaces become more advantageous for uh, certain things. You know, you film in different areas because some of the laws that are local to the area are generous to uh, certain industries where they might be more difficult in certain places. And so um, usually, yeah, that that space, you do want those framed towards the industry or at least considering what some of those differences are. Um, do you think about independent contractors, um, which is what a lot of us find ourselves in, in the space of creative space? Uh, there are common threads federally, but then also, so across the country, but then also each state 
treats those a little bit different, especially now, like we're seeing some really rising laws around that. The way that independent contractors are treated in Illinois is really great. And like, there's some really cutting edge uh, laws around that, but they may not have caught up if you're doing something in Nebraska, you know, or maybe it is cutting edge in Nebraska, et cetera. And so you do want those to be um, pretty more geared towards the specific jurisdiction from a contract standpoint. Um, from an insurance standpoint, it's can't, it's complicated. Um, so under business insurance policies, commercial insurance policies, the typical coverage territory, we call it, is the U.S. and Canada. So if you have an insurance policy and you do something in Florida that someone sues you over, typically your Illinois policy is going to cover you. But insurance policies are also regulated by the states rather than the federal government. So let's suppose you're in Illinois and you move across the imaginary line to Missouri. Um, you will have to cancel all your insurance policies and get new insurance policies um, because you have to get policies that are regulated by the state of Missouri as opposed to the state of Illinois. So moving can be a pain with insurance, but in terms of coverage, you're typically covered in the entire US and Canada. Jess, I think you're muted. Right. Oh. oh, yeah, thank you, Chris, I appreciate that. Um, we also have, um, you know, a specific question that I actually think could be helpful to us just in walking through kind of an example that might help some folks on this call think about how they might just begin. So someone in our Q&A is talking about starting a photography business. So Chris, what would you say is sort of the basic insurance that someone might think about getting as they start something uh, like a like a photography business? What are some of the things they should be thinking about? Sure. Um, so the most basic thing is general liability, um, which would be, let's suppose you're out, you know, shooting somewhere and you drop a camera on someone's foot. That's a general liability claim. And then you would want um, insurance for your gear, which is inland marine coverage. So your gear is covered at home if the house burns down and it's covered out on location. Um, if it you drop it and you know break it when you're you know shooting at an event or something like that. Um, if you're talking more about you know selling your photographs more as a you know as a um, like an art photographer, then you might want to think about errors and emissions insurance, which will actually insure the content of your of your um, photographs. Um, and of course, if you hire anyone at some point, then you would want workers' comp insurance. But probably the most basic things when you start are general liability and rich for your gear. Awesome. Um, I see that there are some questions also about sort of recommendations and contact information. Um, we can certainly have our, our speakers um, share information with registrants after in a follow-up. Um, and just a reminder too that in addition to being able to view all of the recordings on our YouTube channel, um, the slides with contact information will also be in the recording too. So um, you can go back and check that out. Um, I'll take us to one more specific example before I have us wrap, just because I think it's uh, at a different scale and um, just a kind of interesting thing for folks to be, again, thinking about where they fall on the spectrum of different kinds of uh, creative ventures and projects. So. Um, Steve is asking uh, you, Chris, a little bit about a very different kind of stage of uh, venture, a, a feature film that has a $10 million budget um, as compared to, you know, insurance for that small uh, beginning stage photography business. Right. What are some of the various kinds of insurance when you're thinking about that much bigger project that you might recommend someone uh, start with or, or think about there? Yeah, so... Well, first, Steve, congrats on a ten million budget. That's a that's a great budget um, for an indie film. So there's a whole package of coverages that are designed for filmmakers, um, and you know, so we could do a whole seminar on this, um, especially if you get me started. Um, but some of the important things that you might want to think about, like. Um, there is a coverage called third-party property damage that has to do to damage to locations. If you're filming in some high-valued locations like a, you know, a luxury condo building or a high-end office building, that's a really important coverage. 
if you have, you know, some A-list actors that are critical to your production, you may want to have something that's called cast coverage, which um, covers the production if a covered cast member can't work, say they're sick or in an accident. It covers your cost of having to reschedule production. You're going to have to shut down if, you're, if your key actor can't be there. Um, so some other things that um, you may want to think about is, um, let's see, there's so many. Um, you want to make sure that your um, auto uh, physical damage coverage is high enough. If you're renting, say, grip trucks, especially like if you're thinking about, you know, a semi-sized grip truck. Those can be worth, you know, 150000 200000 per vehicle. So you want to make sure that your auto limits are high enough to cover value of the vehicles you're insuring. Um, you want to think about your stunts. If you're having stunts in the production um, that, you know, that you're informing your insurance agent of them and that they confirm that everything you're doing is covered in the policy. So if you're using guns, if you're having fight scenes, if you're... Um, uh, um, you, you know, using cars and having auto accidents and things. Um, and then um, when your film's actually ready for distribution, so this is much later, everything I've talked about so far is production insurance. But when you're thinking about distribution, you need um, errors and emissions insurance, commonly called E&O insurance, and your um, distributor will require that, and that covers the, the content of the film. So... Um, happy to have a deeper dive conversation with you, but, but those are some of the biggies that you want to think about for a larger uh, budget film. Awesome. Well, I know we have some more questions. Um, I want to just give everyone a thank you for your attention today, for your questions. These have been really interesting and what an interesting also way to get a sense of what our audience, what some of you are working on and excited by. Um, I want to remind you that this ongoing programming from the help desk is really here to support you. And so if there are questions that we didn't answer today, if there are particular aspects of contracts or insurance that you want us to do a deeper dive into, we would really love to hear from you. Um, I'm going to drop a poll in the chat or sorry, a, a feedback form in the chat. And we really want to hear from you uh, about how this program went, about what are the topics you'd like to see a little bit more from the help desk in the future. So go ahead and fill that out. Um, and we would love to, to know what you want to see next from us. Um, as a reminder, you can check out the recordings of this as well as our other programs on our Arts Alliance YouTube page. Um, I'll drop the link to that as well. And we are the help, at the help desk are really here for other kinds of ways to support you, whether it's programs like this, whether it's that one-on-one -on -one support and assistance. Come check out our list of public funding opportunities, other workshops. That's at artsalliance.org slash support. So I'll drop that link in the chat. Otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you to Chris and Odell. Thank you to our interpreters. And I hope to see you at a future help desk program sometime soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. All right. Thanks, y'all.